Sure, Douglas Engelbart was an American engineer. He, um, he's, his key work was done really in the 60s and 70s uh, after he had had a kind of a vision one day that uh, he might uh, dedicate his life to uh, helping solve the world's most serious problems which he thought could only be solved if we were actually smarter than we currently <laughs> were at that time, and indeed they still are. Uh, so he thought, well, how can we be possibly smart enough to solve these really complicated problems? And uh, he thought the uh, the only practical path uh, it appeared to him was uh, to develop ways of augmenting the intelligence that we already have. I mean, the brains, of course, are enormously sophisticated uh, you know, cognitive machines, um, but evolved to uh, function in certain ways and not necessarily to be able to solve the enormously complex uh, social, political, economic sorts of problems um, that, that we're currently dealing with. Uh, so he saw the need to extend uh, the power uh, through, uh, through technologies that could complement uh, human thinking. And so he set to work. And extraordinarily enough, he um, developed uh, a range of technologies, uh, some of which were winners and some of which weren't, uh, mouse being most famous, but, but other ones, uh, Windows, of course, the very idea of having Windows on your computer uh, is another one that we all use every day. And uh, he's uh, relatively unknown for the impact that he's had. Uh, of course, there are certain circles within, you know, in which he's very well known, um, but compared with someone like Steve Jobs, um, whose career consisted largely, or not completely of course, but largely in sort of implementing Engelbartian you know, technologies. Um, compared with Steve Jobs, he's almost completely unknown. And, and that's um, yeah, perhaps a, sort of, a certain kind of injustice uh, there, historical injustice. I think it's fair to say, I think most people who, who uh, appreciate the situation would regard him as one of the, really the, the towering figures of, of 20th century technology. No question about it. Um, the, uh, the invention of writing uh, was a uh, intelligence augmentation technology. Um, the invention, the invention of printing, sort of took that uh, to a whole new level. Uh, so uh, certainly throughout human history, you can see the evolution of uh, tools that can function in this uh, uh, augmentation manner. But every now and again, you see a kind of rupture point. You see um, a, a new set of inventions come online that just make an enormous difference. And so that's what we what we saw with uh, the uh, with the kind of transition to the computer age uh, that uh, that Engelbart was a, a really a linchpin of. The research program that I'm going to describe to you is quickly characterizable by saying, if in your office you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day and was instantly responsible, responsive, <laughs> instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? Well, this basically characterizes what we've been pursuing for many years in what we call the Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. I, uh I came across Engelbart's work, I stumbled across it when I was well into what turned out, I think, to be an intelligence aug augmentation exercise. Uh, I was uh, unaware of that whole concept uh, at the time. And uh, I had been working as, as a uh, philosophy instructor in uh, trying to teach undergraduates critical thinking and finding that traditional techniques weren't working very well. I thought, well, how could we do a better job here? And I thought, look, I just want these students to, to go through certain kinds of route routines, critical thinking routines. There are certain, for example, uh, checklists that, that you should uh, either explicitly or at least intuitively go through when you hear someone telling you something. Uh, should you accept what they say? Well, it depends. It depends, you know, are they credible? You know, uh, do they have a, a reason for um, deceiving you? It's sort of questions like this. And I wanted my students to, uh, to learn what these kinds of routines were and to be able to reflexively uh, deploy them. And I started by providing them uh, worksheets, paper worksheets, saying, look, you know, when confronted with this kind of a critical thinking challenge, here's the sheet, just work through this. Then I realised that uh, it would be better if you actually had dynamic or flexible worksheets. And I thought, well, you, maybe you could do that with, with a computer. You could actually uh, program these things. And the, uh, that led, you know, step by step, in the direction of argument mapping software. Uh, a, a 
general purpose uh, software that can help uh, people to actually lay out in visual form the structure of arguments because critical thinking is um, uh, very closely related to, uh, to evidence and argument and um, philosophers particularly have always uh, seen those concepts of, of argument analysis, argument evaluation and critical thinking is very closely aligned. Um, so uh, starting in about uh, 1996 I was um, developing a series of software packages. Uh, with each one, I learned what was wrong and, uh, and had ideas for, for a better package. And then um, yeah, sometime in the late 90s, uh, I became aware that the kind of software that I was developing, aware of two things. One, one is that this kind of software could be useful not just for helping people learn critical thinking, but actually could be used on the job, so to speak. Uh, whenever you're dealing with a really complex set of arguments, to, to be able to map these arguments out, you can see more clearly what you've got. You can comprehend a, a much more complex set of arguments with much more accuracy um, uh, and rigor than uh, is possible if you're just using, as, as most of us do, our raw brain power or brain power augmented by books and a writing paper, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, so I saw the possibility of, of intelligence augmentation using argument mapping software. Uh, then I realised that uh, I came across a paper by Douglas Engelbart written in 1962 where the kind of software that we were developing he had already envisaged uh, and had described in quite a bit of detail. And uh, this is well before any of the uh, technologies that uh, uh, were available to actually implement this kind of concept. But of course he was critical in, inve in inventing those supporting technologies. It wasn't until the 90s that those technologies were sufficiently mature that they could be um, easily adapted to support argument mapping uh, software. So it was a roughly a sort of a 40 year, um, you know, or 30 to 40 year journey from, from his original vision uh, through to the time when uh, these kinds of uh, software packages became, became feasible. Uh, and so uh, when I read that paper, I was amazed to see that somebody could have um, just uh, sort of imagined not just this kind type of a tool, but could have foreseen the need for this kind of a tool to augment our ability to engage in complex argumentation. Because I would say that uh, this is one of the critical weaknesses in our ability to deal, to resolve complex problems. You know, to this day, uh, Engelbart recognised the problem, the problem is still with us, is that um, we have uh, all sorts of wonderful tools like spreadsheets and so forth uh, that can um, greatly extend our capacity to handle, you know, for example, in that case, uh, calculations. Um, but we're still managing complex argument in uh, much the same way as people would have done 200 or 2,000 years ago. And, and frankly, it's a mess. Uh, argumentation, public argumentation or argumentation about complex issues tends to be a, a, a very um, poorly conducted affair. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, the types of augmentation tools and methods that Engelbart was describing hold out some hope at least uh, that we can take complex argumentation to a higher level and have a better chance of reaching a reasonable kind of rational resolution of really critical issues. Yeah, look, evolution, there's no question, has given us this enormously powerful cognitive kind of bedrock, uh, this, this raw kind of power that um, is, is enormously good at certain things. The very fact that I can look out a window and, and in a matter of milliseconds see that there's a tree there, right, is, is a staggering feat, really. And uh, what uh, we're now trying to do, of course, then is take this, this, these evolutionary capacities, um, which work very well in certain sorts of contexts, for certain sorts of tasks, and adapt them to a whole new set of problems. When we do that, we use in intelligence augmentation technologies, such as uh, writing, for example, and um, although on the face of it, uh, we, symbols, writing, look very different to anything that's sort of encountered on the savannah, uh, our comprehension of language actually hinges um, profoundly on our embodiment, uh, on the kinds of concepts we get from, be, from in virtue of being embodied creatures. There are people like George Lakoff who have argued this um, at, at great length. And... Uh, so that, if, for example, if you look at, um, uh, take any, any piece of prose out of the newspaper, 
and and look carefully at um, how it is conveying its message, you'll see it's it's riddled with with um, metaphors. Most of them are kind of bodily related sorts of metaphors. The stock market is rising, for example. Well, you, in fact, you couldn't understand. We couldn't understand stock markets. We couldn't understand virtually any complex matter that we deal with unless we had the ability to use language to encapsulate um, metaphors uh, which are grounded in concepts that arise through being embodied human beings in the kind of world that, that we're in. Uh, so there's a very profound connection between thought um, and, and uh, embodiment and, and, and perception, particularly visual perception. A very large proportion of our brains devoted to, to visual perception. And, um, and that's really where the fundamental insight for argument mapping and its potential as an argument map, as an augmentation technology um, comes into play. The, I'd like to boil it down to a, basically a three-step um, argument, or at least a two-premise, you know, one-step argument, uh, which is that um, argumentation gets very complicated. Uh, you know, look at the climate change, you know, climate policy debate, an enormously complicated set of arguments and issues. Uh, so that's the first you know, unarguable premise. Right? The second one is uh, we know from all sorts of different areas of life that good visualisation helps our minds cope with complexity by tapping into that enormous cognitive power that we've got in the visual areas um, of our brain. So that's why we have something like the Melways, right? a street map uh, in, in visual form rather than written out in prose. Uh, this is really uncontroversial, it's un unremarkable. Um, so put those two ideas together, uh, it ought to be the case that effective visualisation, a well-designed visualisation, would help us understand the, uh, complex argumentation. And I think this is clearly true. It, 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 uh, it, once you get to um, observe real instances of this uh, at work, uh, it's, it's clearly the case that, that it, it augments our capacity to understand the complex stru the structure of complex arguments in just uh, the same sort of way as a good roadmap augments our capacity to understand the structure of a city. And talk to you about the control techniques control devices, control dialogue, and control meta-language that we're using. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot where you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called our mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. That'll show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrew's hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. All right, as it moves up or down or sideways, so does the tracking spot. And the, the principles for its operation are quite easy to see. If you'll turn it over, Don. Can you hear me, Don? Would you turn it over and we'll see, right. Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. But since they're at right angles and kind of sharp edges, one roll and the other slide in one direction. Each of, it, each of these wheels controls through a potentiometer with a voltage output sampled by an 80V converter.